Angela Zhang is a law professor at the University of Hong Kong and author of the new Chinese Antitrust Exceptionalism, the book you should all buy if you want to understand the roots of one of today's central issues in Chinese economic policy. Co-hosting is my colleague from Rhodium, Yvonne Yu. The views expressed here do not re reflect those of the Rhodium group. Angela, welcome to China Talk. It's a pleasure to be here. First off, back when you started research on Chinese anti-monopoly policy, it presumably wasn't A1 News. What first got you interested in the topic? I first began to study Chinese antitrust law when I was a graduate student at the University of Chicago, and that was really a long time ago, back in 2006. And obviously, China did not have an anti-monopoly law at that time. The law wasn't promulgated until 2007, but Everybody was expecting that China is going to have one. And Chicago school was quite famous for antitrust, so I thought it would be interesting to do like a comparative study of the Chinese and the U.S. antitrust law. Eventually, I didn't do that because so much of my writing is not about the law itself. It's more about the politics behind the law. Another important reason actually has to do with my doctoral advisor, Richard Posner. He was a judge and a very prominent um, econ scholar and has done very influential work on antitrust. And he was very supportive of my research proposal at the time. So I thought it would be really cool to study antitrust law under his guidance. So let's talk about the system pre-SAMR. What were the bureaucracies and how did their incentives differ? Before SAMR, China had three antitrust agencies and they're called National Development and Reform Commission, the NDSC, and then there is also the State Administration and Industry and Commerce, the SAIC, and the Minister of Commerce, uh, which we call MOFCOM. And each of these agencies, they have a very different mission, or you can say they have a very different KPI, depending on the functions of their department. For instance, the NDRC is responsible for macroeconomic management and industrial planning. It is also sometimes called mini state council. It was a very powerful ministry when the Chinese economy was centrally planned. But over the years, as the Chinese economy become more liberalized, this department actually have seen a significant decline in power, but still remain very powerful to this day. And then it's in charge of everything, basically. But you can see its history of being involved in central planning. This agency is very interventionist. It has this kind of central planning in its DNA. Explain that point a little bit. How do you see central planning in their actions in the 2000s and 2010s? NDRC uh, is a very interesting ministry in China. The prices in China have all been liberalized over the years, but within NDRC, there are still a couple of departments that are in charge with price regulation and price supervision. And in particular, there was one department called Price Supervision and Anti-Monopoly Bureau, and that department is simultaneously in charge of supervising price, which means just want to stabilize price, make sure the merchants don't raise prices so much that will cause consumer panic. But at the same time, the same bureau also is also in charge of antitrust enforcement. You can see during 2011 and after the Great Recession, around a couple of years after the Great Recession, when there was high inflation in China, this department was very busy going around and talking to merchants and talking to this trade association and ask them, don't raise prices. This will cause consumer panic and, and things like that. But these firms don't, don't quite listen to them. And the price bureau doesn't really have them. This price supervision department doesn't have that much leverage because under the price law, the fine that they can impose is very low. But then once they try to use antitrust law, to deal with these companies, and all of a sudden these companies become very nervous because well, the sanction under antitrust law is really high. It could be astronomical fines and it could involve behavioral or structural remedies. So firms do take it very seriously. And then you then start to see in those cases, as soon as NDRC start investigating these firms, the firms will volunteer to lower prices. This is highly unusual in the antitrust world, because like in antitrust cases, all that the regulator can ask the firm to do is just to stop doing the anti-competitive conduct or to impose a fine. 
but there's no law that says the regulator can ask the firm to reduce prices because that's like price regulation, which is against the idea of having an antitrust law. But you see these firms actually, particularly those foreign firms, they actually volunteer to do that as soon as they become subject to investigation. And I think this is a way to appease the regulator and it's a way to show that they are cooperative because they know if they're cooperative, they can be rewarded with leniency and they will receive less penalty. And so this is a way we can see how, how the history of NDRC being a central planner, being a price regulator actually influence how they take on antitrust cases. I love the, the dynamic of the firm like offering up uh, solutions, be that primarily in price cuts, partially because the interest of the bureaucracy is also to keep their credibility intact. They don't want to fight it out in the courts and lose because then they can't keep playing their game of telling companies what to do and having the companies listen to them. If they can either potentially get 10 or zero by going through a legal process or be 100% sure that they can get three out of 10 by the company saying, oh yeah, sure, we'll cut prices by a little bit. Their preferred outcome most of the time is to have the companies just do the small step voluntarily as opposed to having their power really be tested. I think the vast majority of these companies um, never really thought about going to court with the agency. It's not that these companies think that Chinese judges are weak or they don't trust the judiciary. It's just that you don't see that kind of dynamics in China because the cost for the firm to challenge the agency could be very high. I'm not talking about the legal costs. I'm talking about transaction costs. There are a lot of consequences if they directly confront the agency. Just think about what's happening to Alibaba at the moment, right? No one in the investor world would think that Alibaba would ever challenge SAMR in court for yeah. the decision they make. From Alibaba's standpoint, the sooner they receive the penalty decision, is actually the better because that removes all this uncertainty about its stock prices and about the future of this company as well. Chinese companies are very accustomed to, to be comply and obedient when it comes to government orders. I, I remember when TikTok was trying to venture to the U.S., and uh, Trump was trying to force TikTok to sell the assets, the first instinct of Zhang Yiming, like the CEO of TikTok, was to obey and comply until they realized, oh, we are not in China, we are in the US, we can challenge, we can actually sue the executive branch. And it was, it was very interesting Then, like the whole dynamic changed. So yeah, I, I, I agree. I think it's almost a habit now of Chinese companies to, to comply. I, I elaborate a lot uh, on this kind of power imbalance between government and businesses in China. And in my opinion, I think there are two major factors behind it. The first is that a lot of these companies, they do operate in the legal gray area. Either they work in a very new sector that has not been regulated, but there is a possibility that government regulators may catch up and regulate them later. So that will give the government a lot of leverage in, in dealing with their business. Ant is a perfect example and has kept innovating over the years and has been trying to adapt very quickly to the government's demand, but they always try to run ahead of the regulators. And I think that, that is the one important reason. And second, the law professor myself, what I realize after all this year's practice and observation is there is a limit to what law can do. Behind it, there's always a lot of ambiguity, which will allow the agency and the enforcer a lot of discretion in interpreting the law. And that, again, will give the government a lot of leverage. Like, for instance, under antitrust law, the agency can impose a fine on the firm between 1% to 10% of this firm's turnover, which means its revenue in the previous year. And there is a big, big uncertainty as to which part of the firm's revenue. Are you talking about Alibaba's revenue in, in a city or is it in, in a province or the national revenue or global revenue? There is a lot of uncertainty and a lot of discretion the agency can apply in making decisions. And that again, give the agency leverage. You are absolutely right that almost become the default 
for the Chinese company to be complying with the government's demand for a number of reasons. And a lot of them actually have to do with the institutional settings in China. So there are a few instances in your book where the regulators end up bumping against a non-compliant party, be that an, a powerful SOE or in the case of Qualcomm, a foreign firm, which is willing to fight back because the consequences of what the reg- regulators are proposing is central to this business. Can you tell a few stories about those dynamics and how you've seen them played out in the past? When you think about it, these agencies, they are rarely challenged in court. Those government departments in the U.S. or the European Commission who are frequently challenged in court, they don't need to worry that much about judicial constraints or judicial review. However, that doesn't mean that these agencies do not operate with any constraint, can do whatever they want. They actually operate with very tight constraints because they were just a small bureau, antitrust authority, whether we're talking about the the, the former three agencies or the incumbent one, it is just a very small bureau within a very huge central ministry. So they do need to play by this kind of formal and the tacit rules of the bureaucracy. When the antitrust 40 want to bring a case against a very powerful state-owned firm, particularly when we're talking about those centrally state-owned firms, it face a lot of resistance from within the bureaucracy. So the battleground is not actually fought in court, but rather fought within the bureaucracy. And back in 2011, when the NDIC brought an investigation into China Telecom and China Unicorn, two of the largest telecom firms owned by the central government in China, and that case caused a huge stir because the way the NDIC announced the investigation was highly unusual. It announced its investigation on a state television program, and that caused the stocks of these two companies to tumble. And then following that, there was a a lot of negative media uh, coverage about these two companies. And that's a way for NDIC to mobilize the public sentiments to push forward this case because it ran into stalemate. When it tried to investigate the, these companies, because they were so powerful, they have the, in, the sector regulator and the state asset regulator that are backing them. It was really hard for NDSC to, uh, to deal with these two firms. And actually, these two firms didn't take NDSC seriously at that time. So it wasn't really until NDSC made a big announcement on state television, which allowed it to control this public opinion. It was at that point the shift of attitude from these two large state-owned firms. And then they, these two firms offered some measures to rectify their behavior and then ask NDSC to suspend its case. And the case was actually suspended. There was no fine or penalty imposed on this company. So it's like a compromise between the two factions, you would say. But this is an example we can observe in in a high-profile antitrust case involving vested state interests, the Chinese antitrust authority actually need to resort to extra legal tactics and measures in order to push forward their case. So it's, the case is not really about the law itself. It's more about power. It's more about influence. Why was NDRC chasing the, the China Telecom and Unicorn at that time? Was the intention behind, was it really sincerely anti, anti-monopoly concerns? At the end of the day, no one knows because it, this is very unobservable what is the true motivation. But there are several interpretations here. One plausible interpretation is like NDRC is also in charge of price regulation, particularly telecom regulation. And so by leveraging antitrust law to discipline these two companies also help NDRC to expand its policy control to regulate the prices of telecom because prices of telecoms are also simultaneously uh, monitored by the sector regulator, MIIT. So that's why the sector regulator was very unhappy about the investigation. And actually, the two regulators, MIIT and the NDRC, they fought publicly through those media outlets that they control about whether it's it's legitimate to regulate these two companies. The newspapers that are controlled by MIIT publish a lot of commentaries 
criticizing NDRC's actions. So it eventually become like a fight between these two uh, regulators. Hmm. I feel like that happens a lot with the Chinese ministry, like with the MOF, Ministry of Finance and PBOC, MOF with NDRC. It's like always a power struggle when it comes to comes to these ministries. On that, I wanted to ask a question. Of, I, I feel like China is very pragmatic, and a lot of times the practice of of law is very pragmatic as well. And I feel in the old days, and then that monopoly was more targeting foreign companies. It's almost like a tool sometimes used as forced tech transfer and sometimes used to, to get some kind of like concessions from these foreign companies. Do, would you agree with this, this statement? The thing is, like antitrust enforcement is very unobservable in the sense that it's subject to many different types of interpretations, right? When they investigate a firm, they always have pretty good uh, reasons. They have a strong legal basis to go after these companies, while these cases are never tested in court. So you don't know whether these legal arguments are, are truly legitimate and are truly supported by strong economic evidence. We never even get to that point. But at the least, on the surface, there, there are arguments laid out there. These companies potentially could be liable for antitrust violation. As to the true motivation that they go after these companies, whether it's motivated by protectionisms or other factors, then it's up to people's guess, right? And it's really hard to verify this claim. Simply because antitrust law itself, its enforcement is subject to so much discretion. And there's never a very clear consensus on a specific doctrine or in a specific type of enforcement. People can argue one way or the other. And that's precisely why countries nowadays all have their own antitrust law, because it's a very versatile and very powerful tool to achieve a lot of policy objectives. Angela, I like in the book where you laid out the sort of careerism rationale of it's not necessarily just making sure your bureaucracy stands strong, but also it's a way to stand out in a pretty public manner, right? As a as a, not, bureaucrats who are mostly anonymous, everyone has a phone bill. And if they see someone on TV fighting for them getting a cheaper phone bill, this is something that can, in a very straightforward way, raise your profile. It was funny because like, it just made me think of these uh, states attorneys general in the US who find some state legislator that they get to throw in jail and then run for governor afterwards because they got popular by showing that they're like the crusader for the people. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. But these type of people are quite rare though among Chinese bureaucrats. But we definitely have observed somebody like that. I'm like, I, I call him a policy entrepreneur in my book. And, and, and he has been very influential. Under his leadership, uh, the NDRC have brought a lot of cases, high profile cases both against state-owned firms like China Telecom and China Unicom, as well as foreign firms like Qualcomm into digital. And he's particularly good at media strategies. And it's rare uh, among the antitrust authorities because um, across these three agencies, NDIC is really the one. And he's the, the only one I have observed at the leadership role that has strategically applied media strategy to push forward difficult cases. And I have to say he's very successful, politically very savvy. And his legacy, <laughs> I would say, a lot of the lawyers was talking about him, a lot of officials were talking about him after his departure. And because he did have a very long lasting impact on Chinese antitrust enforcement, even today. And he himself also have achieved a very successful career. He was promoted within the NDSC and then later went on to uh, become mayor in, in a Chinese city. He will be regarded as a superstar, being a technocrat from a central ministry that are able to be elevated to a generalist role in the Chinese government, it's, it's highly unusual. And I think this kind of dispositions and personality and of a particular mid to senior level bureaucrat can have a very big impact on the policy agenda and the enforcement process. Truly, it was a dangerous game for him to play. Yes, and, and during my interview, I mean, all these people will agree with that. On the other hand, you can say he's very courageous, right? He's dared to go after the largest state-owned firms, and he dared to go after Qualcomm. Qualcomm is not an easy player to tackle because Qualcomm has so much 
skin in the game in China. Qualcomm has over 50% uh, of its revenue coming from China. So Qualcomm really fought very hard against NDRC at that time. They mobilized all sorts of efforts, including the politician lobbyists and go way up to the US president to lobby against this case. And, and, and the NDRC really have to resist a lot of pressures from within the bureaucracy in dealing with all these cases. And he's highly exceptional uh, as a leader that have that kind of guts and this kind of wits to to deal with all these difficult cases. I never think that Teddy Roosevelt would be proud of a uh, former vice mayor of Shanghai. But anyways, there you go. I wanted to expand a little bit on that and make an observation. I used to be a policy consultant for MNCs in China, and we always used the Qualcomm case as a textbook resolution that Qualcomm was able to reach with the, with NDRC. But the, the thing is that it indeed is a compromise, and it's interesting that actually Qualcomm did a lot of other things in a way of industrial policies to, to up the game. For example, Qualcomm collaborated with a SMIC, uh, on like 28 nanometer wafer production, help China to upgrade its tech and core technology and help China to roll out 4G LTE networks. So sometimes I even wonder, did China did it just so they can get help from Qualcomm on technology? That is a tactical choice. They, they knew they couldn't force Qualcomm out because that was their whole business model. But at least they can get the best out of it, which is get technology from Qualcomm. I tend to believe a more simple reason behind that. Actually, the Qualcomm investigation was initiated partly upon complaints from U.S. competitors. It's not even the Chinese buyers of Qualcomm like Huawei. That they weren't the initial complainants. It was an initial complaint. Qualcomm have a lot of enemies everywhere. And one of the, the biggest complainants actually are American companies. They did go to Beijing to um, meet with the authorities and complain about Qualcomm. So I wouldn't formulate a conspiracy theory behind the Qualcomm investigation. And for the most part, if you are a antitrust authority sitting in Beijing and you are dealing with hundreds of cases each year and you have very limited capacity, you don't really have time to think about how do I formulate a strategy of going after which company that will help me advance my career. You don't even get to that point, right? I mean, because first you need to decide whether I'm going to deal with these cases that have come before me. So it's more of a reactive process. But of course, when they are choosing these cases, they do have a lot of discretion. And you can say that's part of a selective enforcement process. It's almost inevitable. Right. And who do I go after? In what kind of approach I deal with these firms is subject to a lot of discretion. And obviously, it must have been through very a careful consideration that they decided that let's bring the fire, all the fire, and go after Qualcomm. And and Qualcomm was very nervous at that time. It hired the best lawyers, the best economists in China, and it it go and talk to everybody and trying to enlist help from everybody because they are acutely aware if they lose their case in China in the sense that if China did ask Qualcomm to change its business model in, in charging royalty rate, it will be, have a huge impact on the revenue in China and it will also have spillover effects on its case in other jurisdictions because there are complainants in the US, in EU, in South Korea, because it has so many enemies. So that's why Qualcomm really was the exceptional company that fought very hard against uh, the NDRC and even thought about going to court in the worst case scenario. But obviously they were able to reach a compromise at the very end with the NDRC. So they were subject to the very high fine, almost $1 billion, but still for them, this is nothing. And yes, it didn't really ask them to change the business model. But what is particularly interesting about the Qualcomm case was something that's not in the decision. Because what Qualcomm did was they volunteered to lower their prices for their products. But that was actually omitted in the final decision. But you can find it in Qualcomm's press release. So you, you see this company did offer NDSE what it wanted but it was not formally included in a part of the decision. And I would say this is a very Chinese characteristic way of doing things. And, and Qualcomm is not the only one of them. There are so many companies before Qualcomm that volunteered to reduce prices to 
to a police regulator. If only we can all one day look at a billion dollars and say, oh, that's nothing. Uh, Angela, <laughs> let's take it. Let's take it to the present day. What's the backstory with the troubles that Jack Ma and Financial and I guess now Alibaba have been having with this sort of regulatory push? And has been controversial from day one. It has always been operating in a regulatory minefield, and the PBOC has been keeping a very close eye on this company for f- from its birth, basically. And there are several things going on here. First of all, Ant operates kind of like the bank, but it's not exactly Miss Bank. It did absorb some deposit and also lend out money but it doesn't need to fulfill this kind of strict capital reserve requirements like a bank. And that makes PBOC's job difficult because one of the ways PBOC manages monetary policy is through changing and adjusting the capital reserve requirements for banks. And for a company with such a huge size like Ant, but it is out of PBOC's reach. So that kind of annoys the regulator. The second thing is the competition with the Western interest because Ant partnered with the Chinese banks to extend loans to um, the borrowers and, and small businesses. And now if you look at Ant's IPO filing, 98% of these loans come from bank and, and banks also bear the risk of default. So bank was bearing all this risk and extending the money. But and has a very strong bargaining position, and it was able to take away about 30 to 40 percent of the interest rate payments, this profit from the bank. So the banks were, of course, not very happy about this deal, right? But because and is such a popular platform, the banks doesn't have that much leverage. So I believe this recent regulatory activity against and also helps these banks to gain more bargaining leverage in dealing with Ant, because Ant is essentially like an Amazon of microfinance, right? And all these banks are the suppliers, and the suppliers are not happy because they feel their profits have been squeezed by uh, Ant. So now with all this regulatory initiative, it will allow these banks to have more negotiating power in dealing with Ant. And the last thing has to do with the issue of how regulators deal with uncertainty. Now, a lot of people has been asking me the same question. Why does Ant get the IPO clearance at the beginning, but then you shut it down two days before the IPO? And obviously, and that gave uh, rise to a lot of speculation about how this whole decision is highly political. From my perspective, I think it has more to do with the regulation issues. It's the fact that there's so much that Ant's business could potentially carry. It's, it's a quite unknown. So regulators, they do have quite different opinions of how we should regulate this kind of risk of uncertainty. Especially once Ant filed for IPO, there is more disclosure coming out from Ant's IPO filing, which reveals Ant's lending business and its business model. And at the same time, Ant's IPO is very popular and was oversubscribed. And it also received the premiums as a tech firm rather than a bank, which got PBOC very nervous because PBOC has always been in the mindset of regulating Ant like a tech, uh, like a bank rather than tech. So regulators become very nervous about this huge bubble that is creating by the IPO. And I think that's why regulators like PBOC really want to ring in the firm. And I think Jack Ma's famous speech in Shanghai just gave the regulators this opening to tackle this problem. Let's stay on this speech for a little bit because we haven't talked about it on China Talk yet. What was your first reaction when you read it or heard it? Oh, yeah. At first, I was shocked that somebody dared to say that publicly in front of so many senior regulators. Jack was saying how the regulation was outdated, how the Basel rules was like an elements club, and how banks are like pawn shops. And in in some regulators' mind, this is like a humiliation of what they have been doing and have been advocating. Because since 2018, there was a very clear regulatory shift among the Chinese finance regulator in trying to exert greater control over the non-financial firms that operate in financial business. 
Essentially, the Chinese government have been trying in the past few years, trying to do this deleveraging campaign, trying to reduce the influence of shadow banking. And so what Jack was talking during the speech was directly in contradiction with all these policy shifts that the senior financial regulator was saying. It's just a slap on their face. If I were the regulator, I, I, that would be how I feel about it. But at the same time, this episode also remind me what, of what happened back in around 2014, 2015. And that was also elaborated in my book. And Alibaba at that time also have a direct confrontation with the regulator, which is the SAIC, which is the predecessor of SAMR. And at that time, the, the regulator released some negative uh, results about counterfeit products on the Taobao platform and Taobao rebutted publicly and said that the SAIC's uh, report contained procedural errors and the director of that e-commerce bureau was blowing black whistle. And that really annoyed the regulator at that time. The regulator then released a white paper, which was actually an old report that it has with Alibaba, which contained a lot of negative news about the firm and released it on its website. And that caused Alibaba stock to tumble almost 8% in one day. And that event actually led to Jack Ma flying to Beijing to meet with the head of the SAIC at that time. And eventually they reached a compromise and, and the report was removed. And then there was no more, uh, unlike now, the whole things were completely blew up. But it's kind of a, a little bit deja vu, but at a very different scale. Obviously, this time, in one day, Alibaba lost over 13% of its market capitalization, which is even worse than back in yeah. 2014. Yeah, and the crazy thing is my, my reading of the 2014 episode in your book is that they were right in that it was pretty selective, them just finding like random little fake goods on Taobao or whatever. And it's still possible that Jack Ma's critique of the financial regulatory structure isn't completely unfounded, but w once you raise this to the level of personal challenges and striking at the heart of what these bureaucracies are and what they do and their place in the system, then you really raise the stakes. And if you lose, you can lose huge. And that actually go back to the earlier point we were discussing about this kind of power imbalance between government and business in China and the fact that the government has so much leverage over these companies because these companies always are found to operate in the legal gray area. Right? There are so many other things the government can go after you, whether we're talking about counterfeit or talking about antitrust or financial regulation. There's so many things on the plate. So that's why the default for most companies will be to you know, cooperate and you can uh, lobby within the bureaucracy and try to get a better deal, but don't fight publicly with the government. That, that doesn't leave you to a very good consequence as you can see what's happening with Ant. That note, I wanted to, to point to a view that you express in the book, which I very much agree, is that there's no clear distinction between ownership and control for Chinese firms. And could you like elaborate a little bit of how government is able to exert control over companies, even though it's private companies that with only limited ownership of SOEs and what might be their incentives? to control these companies. In general, I don't want to give the readers the impression that the Chinese government can dictate everything firms do. I mean, firms do have significant discretion in running the business, even including state-owned firms, and they do fiercely compete with each other. And for the most part, the Chinese government has very little incentive to coordinate activities. And they don't have the ability to, to do that either because of decades of market reform. They do want to give the firm the autonomy to run the business because if they really exert very tight control, firms will lose this kind of vitality in competition. But at the same time, in times of important policy needs, like for instance, if there is a health crisis like COVID, you will see the Chinese government are in the position to mobilize companies, particularly the state-owned companies, to work very quickly, like Sinocam, and there's a lot of Chinese state-owned firms at that time. They start to run up the supply very quickly to produce masks, to produce ventilators, to produce all this health equipment to uh, serve the public needs. And then similarly, in this kind of Bell and Road initiative, you will see a lot of both 
state-owned firms and private firms, they volunteer to join the initiative to contribute to the, the Belt and Road projects and, and investments. And for the most part, the government don't really need to tell the firm exactly what to do because this kind of incentive could be more subtle. It's like firms can express their loyalty by you know, responding to the policy calls from the government. Because if you're an entrepreneur in China, you will understand it's much easier to run a business if what it is doing is deemed consistent with the party line rather than contravening the party line. That's what we've seen uh, with the recent episode with Ant. And now following the party line doesn't necessarily mean things political. It could mean a lot of things because the party have a lot of different objectives and, and these different objectives Objectives could be could be prioritized at different times, right? Sometimes it could be economic growth, and sometimes it could be economic stability. So, if you recall, a few years ago, when she first came into power in 2012, there was a great emphasis on reform, and that was the only thing you heard: economic reform, market reform, for a couple of years. And there was a lot of initiative encouraging innovation, entrepreneurship. And you heard this private business like Tencent and Alibaba really join in the, this campaign and trying to actually more entrepreneurship. And there was a lot of initiative at that time. But then during Xi's second term, there's greater emphasis on stability, social stability, financial stability, economic stability. And then firms then gradually shift. And those that didn't adjust very well and adapt very well to this kind of state demand will unfortunately be deemed inconsistent. And then eventually they didn't do very well. It didn't lead to very good consequence. I have a very embarrassing Douyin feed. Of late, it's been a lot of videos of young people just like explaining the 14th five-year plan and how you should align your future professional <laughs> dreams to make sure that whatever you're doing is in accordance with the party's plan for the country. Definitely not a trend that's going anywhere anytime soon. Being sure you're on the right side of the prioritization of the party at any point in time. So changing gears a little bit, in your book, you also talk about the interaction between Chinese and Western regulators. In the past year or so, we've seen Chinese regulators adopt many of the tools that the, the U.S. government has in its toolkit with regards to export controls and extraterritorial sanctions and even the push to undermine U.S. extraterritorial sanctions. How do Chinese regulators learn from what's happening in the West and how do they try to incorporate that or not in the way that they do their work, both with respect to anti-monopoly as well as these sort of more economic lawfare type tools that we've seen really come to the fore during the Trump administration? I like the, the way you phrase it as illegal warfare. And that's something that the Chinese leadership and, and also the Chinese public starting to realize really since the Huawei incident, particularly the arrest of Wanzhou, that was a wake up call for, for the Chinese government that the U.S. Uh, has such strong extraterritorial sanctioning power over Chinese companies, even those activities seemingly have very little nexus with the United States. Like this kind of activities actually occur outside the United States, but the U.S. was still able to exert influence on this on these deals. And the, the first reaction from the Chinese policymaker is we need to do something. We cannot sit there and do nothing. And then we need to come up with a countermeasure. And that's precisely why China is thinking about a tick for tack strategy, that we also need to have our long arm jurisdiction to counter the, the US sanctions on Chinese companies and Chinese individuals. And it's very natural for them to think about antitrust because antitrust law do allow government the power to exert extraterritorial control over businesses. Even those activities seemingly have little nexus with China. Just think about a deal like Qualcomm's proposed acquisition, the NXP, which is like a $44 billion deal. And the deal occurred offshore, seemingly have little to do with China. But the parties would need to obtain merger clearance from the Chinese antitrust authority because without it, they cannot close the deal. 
So this deal was notified to multiple jurisdictions, actually nine jurisdictions, and the party obtained clearance from eight of them. And China was the only one that held up this deal. And eventually, the parties abandoned the deal because they felt that they had no chance of getting clearance in China. You can tell how powerful antitrust、uh, law could be in holding up. Large mergers between multinational companies that seemingly have little nexus with China, because these companies they do sell to China, even though this deal doesn't occur on,、uh, in China and the target is not in China. But China has this power to、uh, exert influence on this deal, and that will give China leverage in countering sanctions from the United States. So one of the things I found curious in the past few years is even as the U.S. has kept adding more and more firms to the entity list, China has been dangling the prospect of an unreliable entity list for years now, but has never really brought a lot of pain to American firms that have exposure in China. So why do you consider this list to be the atomic bomb of coercive economic measures, and what's going on here with the hesitancy to put this on the table? That's absolutely a great question. China definitely has been pondering.、Uh, The non-reliable entity list for a long time, and it wasn't really until last year they they finally promulgated one. And so far, there have been no enforcement activity, and there have been rumors before that firms like FedEx and HSBC will be on the list. But we've been waiting for a long time, it, and it seems like this law is, I would say, more bark than bite. And I think there are several reasons behind that. First, I think it's not in China's interest. To really use the law to penalize these firms, because amid all these geopolitical tensions that China has with with other countries, the last thing China wants is to see more decoupling. From the China standpoint, it is in its strong interest to attract more foreign investment, because the foreign investment will be very important stabilizing forces for the government, because these companies can also be important allies for them to lobby、uh, against sanctions against China. And on the other hand, China do want to flash its muscle and demonstrate it has ability to retaliate against U.S. coercive measure, and that's the reason why I think it will it promulgate this unreliable entity list, as well as doing a bunch of other things like introducing the blocking statute. But at the end of the day, I think the government will be extremely cautious in applying this law because they don't want to discourage foreign investment. They don't want to cause a panic because this is a time when the government actually really need them. That's why I make analogy that these are like weapons of mass retaliation that I don't think the government will consider using it un- unless at the very last resort. Yeah, because it's interesting. Like on the one hand. China doesn't want decoupling, but it really does on its own terms. The the whole like Sichu Chuangxin push of self reliance and breaking the 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 choke points and whatnot is clearly an, a, a huge priority when it comes to Beijing. But at the same time, they see a role for foreign firms in helping Chinese firms be able to get to the point. Where they can stand on their own and create globally competitive、uh, products without the inputs from the West and the risks that you get exposed to by having a proprietary Western technology in your supply chains. You can another way for us to think about it is this is China's strategy to buy more time because as long as they have this foreign investment within China, these foreign players will have foreign businesses like Wall Street. Uh, or tech firms like Qualcomm and Apple, they will have a strong interest in becoming important stabilizing force for the Chinese government against the U.S. sanctions and against U.S. pressure. And, and these will be important allies for the Chinese government to help China to buy more time before it become completely self-sufficient. Angela and Yvonne, thanks so much for being a part of China Talk. Thank you. It was great to be here. Thanks, Jordan. Chain turning, 你坐在马脚还在 same page， 爱人都超过了 inmate。你女友都为我心。
I'll pick up the phone and fuck on your mama. Nigga, man, I got weight, yeah. Need my love, shout out, go great, yeah. Go on, they go on, they do it, yeah. You cannot fuck with little ace, yeah. What's up, they go on, 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 they go